Welcome to this week's episode of Being Human. I'm delighted to say my guest is Christina Woodkey. She is an author and a lecturer in HCI at Stanford. Christina, welcome to the show. Hi, nice to be here. Thank you for having me. No, thank you. And you are from Stanford itself, right? You're in your office within the campus. You're this is my office. This is what a Stanford office looks like, full of books. <laughs> Pretty standard stuff. And the reason that I wanted to get you on the show is that I was working with a, with a client and I'd read something somewhere about OKRs and they seemed like they might be quite a, a, a good uh, technique to experiment with, with a client who was thinking about how they form some objectives. And I found your book, Radical Focus, ended up implementing OKRs with this client. They were, they were a huge success uh, and made a, a material difference in the success of that uh, initiative that I was working on. And so I've had them as part of my toolkit any, ever since. And so the chance to, to speak to you about uh, the, the intricacies of, of OKRs was, a, was a, an opportunity I couldn't miss. So... Yes, again, um, that's that's the connection, and thank you for being here. Well, thank you so much. Again, we'll just, we'll be very British about it and say yeah, thank we'll you for just, about we'll just keep thanking each other for the next fifteen minutes. So, <laughs> let's start with well, let's start with OKR. So that I mean, that's an acronym to start with. So there may be some people listening who've not even heard of of that as an acronym. Um, so should we unpack it a bit and start start with a def definition? Absolutely. In fact, I think that using the uh, acronym can become kind of dangerous because you think of it as a thing. So it's really important to remember what the words stand for. So uh, the O is objective, and it is an aspirational, inspiring mission for a short period of time. So say three months or one year, uh, often the rhythm of an OKR is quarterly. And then the key results answer the question, what would change if we succeeded? How would we know if we succeeded? So if our objective is to delight customers, then how do we measure delight? Is it going to be an NPS? Does it have to do with how many people sign up? Does it have to do with word of mouth? We can start exploring what metrics will define those sort of fuzzy words like delight. And because of the combination of being inspirational and metric driven, they tend to unite companies in a way that pure KPIs don't. I often joke that KPIs are OKRs with a soul um, because there are a lot of people for whom numbers are less meaningful. And I know that sounds shocking, but it's real. You know, sometimes it's a designer, sometimes it's a customer service person. I don't want to generalize too much, but there are a bunch of people who just aren't motivated by numbers the way some CEOs might be. And by creating an OKR that combines both the vision and the metrics, you have something that's much more complete and um, not to use that uh, disproven old model, but the uh, left brain and the right brain can work together. Right, right. And so what's the, so what's the sort of the typical process then for constructing a, an, an objective and a key result? How does that work for, for somebody who's listening here? What's the process? Oh, well, it can be top down or it can be bottom up. Uh, my favorite is always a combination. What I've discovered is that um, if you can poll your company on what they think the critical themes are, a CEO can get a lot of really interesting insights in what really matters. So I always recommend that about two weeks before the quarter starts, you don't want to be setting your OKR once the quarter starts because then you, oh, it's just messy. Um, you're tr spending a lot of time while time's wasting away. So about two weeks before the quarter starts, um, it's good to set out a survey or a poll or something and get everybody's idea about what could the objective be. Uh, and then if you have an intern or somebody who can crunch it, um, come up with the big themes, bring it to the executive group. The executive group then can look it through. They probably have their own ideas. Um, you spend a couple hours really working through what is the right objective, what is going to be the number one theme for this quarter for our company. And then after that, um, then you get to get into the KRs. And I, I prefer to lead with uh, the objective because I tend to be more of a vision person. But uh, some people will say, I think this number really matters. And then you have to sort of ask them, well, why that number? What is that number telling you? What does that number mean? Like if your revenue number is going up, does that mean 
people like you? Does that mean that people want your product? Does that mean that your marketing's working? Sometimes you have to sort of, in my mind, reverse engineer it from the number because people who work with numbers have an instinct for them. But no matter what, you're going to define it. And the art of putting together good KRs is they should balance them each other. So let's say you have a high revenue number. You also might want to have an NPS number so that you don't get things like, I don't know if you heard about the Wells Fargo scandal where they set really high goals for their people and their people ended up, uh, the frontline people ended up uh, signing people up for accounts that they never expected to be signed up for. So the time you spend in the goal is also spent time spent really thinking about what kind of result you want. It's not enough just to have your revenue up. Go up, you want the revenue to be sustainable. You want it based on really good product practices. You want it to be something meaningful because you can't trick the market quarter after quarter after quarter. Eventually, it collapses. So what you want is very thoughtful, uh, powerful, sustainable um, growth. Right. Okay. And so there's several things in there, actually. So I think I suppose the first one is, and I suppose this is implied by the title of your of your of your first book, Radical Focus, is just having one. Right. That that's what you're saying. Just one objective. I mean, a lot of people listening to this at top of the organizations are thinking, whoa, 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 whoa. We can't just have one objective. This is definitely the most controversial thing I did. And I joke with people. It's like mine was mine was the very first book on OKRs. It could have been called. OKRs. That's what it's. That's the title of the book in China and Japan. But I chose to title well, it radical. OKR. Oh, <laughs> okay. Oh, yes, exactly. <laughs> one, one giant thing. Um, but I chose radical focus because I think that that's the whole point of having an OKR is so that every single person working in the company company knows what the number one priority is. Doesn't mean it doesn't mean there aren't other things you're doing. But OKRs are a solution to a very specific problem. And um, if you're familiar with the Eisenhower matrix, it's a two by two, right? So it's a very simple two by two. This would be a great time to be able to draw. <laughs> just and and Google while just you're imagine two, Yeah, well, so imagine one of the most common two by twos, right? Everybody's seen these. And um, one of the axes is important and unimportant. And the other axes is urgent and not urgent. And so this was developed by President Eisenhower because he was finding out that he couldn't scale, the same thing many CEOs and other leaders find. And so he realized that when it's important and not urgent, he had to plan to do it. If it's important and urgent, you should just do it. If it's unimportant and it's urgent, you should delegate it. And if it's unimportant and not urgent, you should defer it, just like blow it off. Mm -hmm. And... The word plan in important and not urgent resonates with so many of the people I advise. What they struggle with is that there's so many interesting shiny objects, there's so many opportunities that somehow they find themselves quarter after quarter not doing the thing that they know is absolutely critical to their growth as a company, to their health as a company. So OKRs are a way of, uh, if you want to think project management style, look, yeah, there we go. Oh, that's a beautiful uh, Eisenhower matrix. Super awesome. Yeah. So how do we say do it now? Um, or how do we, oh, good Lord, schedule. There we go. The blue one in the upper right. This one's uh, slightly differently aligned that I'm familiar. Yeah, that beautiful teal color. That's actually one of my favorite colors. So that works out. <laughs> And for um, those listening, we're just showing the Eisenhower matrix here. And so the top right is decide, schedule a time to do it. So it's not urgent, but it's important. Absolutely. So how do we schedule a time to do it? Um, what I just discovered, I have a 13-year-old daughter. And um, when I ask her when she's doing homework, she says tomorrow. And I've, I've noticed that tomorrow never comes. It's tomorrow is always <laughs> not today. And so OKRs say tomorrow is now today. OKRs say you know this really critically important thing that isn't urgent? It's time to make it urgent. We are going to commit to actually making it happen this quarter. And so I see a lot of people try to shoehorn OKRs into doing lots of other things. They try to do it as for their projects. They try to do it for every single person's job as an OKR. And I personally prefer to save it for that important but not urgent as a way of adding a time frame to it and making it urgent. I really think that OKRs are about realizing strategy. They're really not a complete management philosophy. Um, they're just about setting goals based on good strategy and achieving them. Um, because I've had so many clients ask me about 
other things, um, I'm working on another book that talks about other aspects of uh, management around OKRs. But it's really, really critical to do these strategically important non-urgent things. And that is the highest value use of OKRs. Right. Right. And, and, and I suppose my experience in limited, you have to Right. My experience of input when, when you go into an organization is that even getting them down, because the one organization I worked with, getting them down to five or six was like a major achievement. I mean, that was down from their 15 or whatever corporate objectives. So just, to, just that we got to a handful was, was something that was very important. Um, but getting yes. down... Once you get, oh, I'm so sorry. So, so, but is there a scale at which you say, okay, for a, a certain size of com- company, um, one just... Uh, you know, a two or three is good enough, or is it always is it always this one that you're looking for at the, at the highest level? Um, so there's there's two answers. The first answer is my rule of thumb is one per business model. If you're big enough to have multiple business models, you're big enough to have mul- multiple OKRs. Um, that's the little rough. Like you can't ask Google to have the same OKR for their self driving cars as they do for their search engine. That's just silly, right? But when you have a, a smaller company, and by smaller, it could be 250 people, it could be 1,000 people. Like Small companies um, still can get pretty big. And in fact, it's almost more critical to have that kind of focus when they're at that awkward adolescent size where they've gotten big and you, you don't have the founder sitting next to you any longer. Um, at which point, then I would take the five or six um, objectives and I would say, okay, let's take a look at these. Um, can we sequence them? So, for example, um, why would you focus on acquisition when you're not good at conversion? That's a waste of advertising money. That's a waste of your efforts. So maybe what we want to do is we really want to make sure we fix conversion. Oh, wait a second. Maybe we shouldn't fix conversion until we fix retention. Okay, so maybe Q1 is retention, Q2 is conversion, and Q3 is acquisition. Um, I wish life was that easy, but it's it's a decent example of it. So thinking about sequencing can be really powerful. If you do everything all at once, you'll do it all shitty. Um, Excuse my language. So the other thing to think about is uh, um, people don't forget. So if you spend one month getting really good at retention, and then you say, okay, this quarter is going to be about conversion, people don't just throw out all the knowledge that they've gotten. You're thinking, you're thinking about building organizational capabilities and building organizational knowledge. And that comes out of the sequencing. So as you think about the sequencing, you can be really intelligent about it. And often using something as simple as looking at um, the, the four quarters as a sequence, you can often get people to come down quite a bit in that area. Um, the other thing I watch for is a classic mistake where people start coming up with, uh, well, this is this department's OKR and this is this department's OKR. And then, then I will say to them, well, is there a combination OKR that will bring it all in together? Is there a way to unite folks? Um, is there, it, are these OKRs in service to a larger OKR, possibly? These OKR sets, I should really say. Um, And that's often a really good question because everybody wants to give everybody something, if you know what I'm saying. Like, oh, but legal doesn't have any OKRs. And I'm like, legal doesn't need any OKRs. They really don't. You know, they just, they need to know what the company's OKR is and they need to drop everything when when they're important to that. Otherwise, they can just keep us from being sued like they always do. They're lovely. So um, it's... It's, it's not that everybody gets their own little OKR. It's saying this is the most important thing for the business. Um, and then thinking about how are we going to do it, but then you can still keep do- doing everything else that's really critical. Health right. metrics all, often companies too for that. It, it adds as a, a balancing factor to the OKR. And they're like, what are we going to do about customer satisfaction or revenue in this little weird corner of our world? And I'll be like, just monitor it, put it in the health metric. Okay, so there are certain metrics that we might want to monitor, but we don't necessarily want to have some specific number we're going to try and hit in in a particular quarter. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, if if so, all of a sudden 
usage drops precipitously, you're going to want to call a code red. Um, that's what we called it um, elsewhere because often uh, I teach people to monitor their health metrics in green, yellow, red. It's very loose. It's very comfortable because then if your metric goes into the red, uh, you can say, okay, stop everything. Let's really fix this problem. Okay. A classic that- code red is code health. Like okay. if all of a sudden every time you launch something, everything breaks and you're down for two days. You can probably call a code red on your uh, a code red on your code, and that means we stop everything and make sure that we actually uh, fix the code so that we can keep going towards our OKRs. Okay, so I'm starting to build a picture. So you've got certain health metrics which are, which are happening all of the time, and then each quarter you're picking one thing you're going to radically focus on, and it may be that only a certain department's involved, or even just part of one department's involved, but that's okay. But, but it's it's still the focus for the whole company, if you like, that that's the one thing that's that, that's important that, that quarter. Well, hopefully it's big enough that multiple departments are involved. Um, it should it should be, yeah, if you say, you know our OKR is this weird little experimental thing in the corner, that's not really uniting the company towards a big push. Okay, so it's, it, it would typically involve more than one department, but it doesn't have to involve everyone. Exactly. There's always going to be some service departments that are running perfectly well as business as usual departments, so to speak. Um, customer service can be one, legal can be one. Um, but if you want them to push, let's say uh, you want customer service to reimagine themselves as a sales department, this is a strategy that's been very useful for a lot of people from Wells Fargo to Comcast, um, where during customer service, you're always constantly thinking about upselling people, making them happier, making them uh, moving them into an account that you might want. Um, you might decide that they're moving out of business of usual and into a push situation, at which point they might be part of an OKR or they might even have their own. Right. Okay. Now, now this we talked about this before we came on. So this idea of having a, a specific number, um, so that other guests on this podcast and other places that I've read have have been highly critical of this idea of a singular target, right? I mean, Deming said that we shouldn't have. He, he described numerical quotas in, in in his writing. We had a guy who wrote the Happiness Manifesto, who who talks about happiness at work being um, um, not not. Um, and not not helped by having specific targets um because of you know the anxiety and the gaming and so on that it can it can induce in the workplace so so you know what's your answer to those who are critical of having specific targets well there's two things there i want to make sure i hit both of them so the first one is about numbers so i went to art school I painted for years and waited tables till the internet came and I was like, oh boy, internet. And so I've got to be the least mathy person you'll ever meet in your entire life in some ways, if you think of the prejudice of artists not caring for math. But what I love is feedback. One of the things I think is incredibly important is, is what I'm doing actually having an effect in the world? So for me to say, uh, I'm launching this new product, Unless I'm an artist and I'm making this product for myself and I'm like, I've made a commentary on the nature of social media by making social media. I'm Ian Bogost and I'm making Cow Clicker, which is a Facebook app about clicking on cows and nothing else. You know, those are those are works of art and that's wonderful. But if I want to have an effect, I usually have an effect in mind. And then I'm going to ask myself, well, how big of an effect can I have? For me, that's tied to meaning profoundly. And for me, happiness at work involves meaningful work. So I might ask myself, you know, uh, as a teacher, is it going to be teaching reviews? The students do student evaluations. Is it, I'm going to give them a test at the beginning of the quarter and at the end of the quarter, and I'm going to learn how effectively I taught them. Am I going to have them write reflection essays and see if they brought up ethics, because that's something I care about a lot. But what is the point of trying to do something unless you find out if you can do it and learn how to get better at it. I just don't see that. So I don't think of it as quotas. You have to meet this target. But I think of it as realizing possibilities in a way that you can actually get feedback back from it. 
Um, and I know there are a lot of small-minded people that just want to set higher and higher targets. And that's a profound misuse of the way I think about OKRs anyway. Um, it's been one of my biggest struggles since writing the book is I get contacted by people who are often seeing OKRs as a way of getting squeezing a little more productivity out of people. And I say no to those gigs because they're just very upsetting to me. Instead, when I was first thinking of getting OKRs in the world, I was trying to answer the question, why do all these well-meaning people have so little effect? And I thought if they could only set a target for what was really important and then start measuring against it and start, start trying different strategies to accomplish that, how much more effective would people be? How much more effective would teachers be? How much more effective would nonprofits be? How much more effective would social good companies be? And, you know, a tool is a tool. You can use a hammer to build a house or murder someone. Um, it, that's the cost of making tools, unfortunately. But my hope is always that by creating a system that has feedback, you can get more effective meaning out of your workplace. And that really, really, really matters to me. So the second piece is compensation and fear in the workplace. Uh, I was talking to a colleague and I feel like often in the workplace, fear is like this low hum. You know, when you're in your house and something's buzzing and it's electronic and you're like, where is this coming from? Is it the neighbor? Is there electronic? You, just, you can't even think. You can't. It's low. It shouldn't be bothering you, but it's making you crazy. I feel like a lot of workplaces, fear is that way. You have this low hum of fear. And so if you set OKRs, but you don't compensate people on their ability to hit those targets, then you can create a workplace that's about meaning rather than some Pavlovian Skinner box, here's your carrot, I won't work without my carrot. Um, extrinsic motivation is just death. So then everybody asks me, well, how do you compensate people? And um, my joke is you shoot for the moon, but if you don't make the moon, at least you have Velcro and Tang. You want to compensate people on what did they achieve along the way? What extraordinary things happened? So um, I believe in a quarterly feedback system, at which point you should be able to go quickly through your weekly statuses and write up about 500 words about how you contributed. And your contributions can be in your OKR and it can also be in your position. So how did you contribute to the company's OKR? And then how did you fulfill your role? And I always recommend a third thing to base it on, which is how did you grow? Did you spend some time getting better at your job? Did you spend some time building new skills that'll let you become more valuable to both the company and your own sense of well-being? And I find that if you have a review process that's based on, am I contributing to something meaningful? Am I fulfilling my role? And am I constantly growing? You have people that are, that are full of joy and excitement, which is why even though we commit on Monday, we always celebrate on Friday because you have to celebrate what you're doing. Um, you have to celebrate the progress you're making. If you're trying to do impossible things, it just gets depressing after a while unless you celebrate what you actually do accomplish. Right, and that's part of the, your suggested way for how you manage teams in the context of the OKR is you commit on the Monday and you celebrate on the Friday. Um, yeah. Yeah. OKRs okay, work best with a certain process for sure. Right. But just coming briefly, again, playing David, devil's advocate here. What, you, oh, you he doesn't about, need an advocate. He's a good lawyer himself. Never be the devil's advocate. You are who your client is. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so <laughs> what, why not just... OKMs, you know, why not just objective and key measures? We could still have the feedback. We could still be focusing on those numbers. But with, what, what, why the specific result um, rather than just the measure that, that, that we monitor? I have no idea what the difference between a measurement and a result is. They seem about the same from where I'm sitting. Well, I guess the one is you would have a specific number that you would say, we're going to hit X by the end of this quarter. And the measure would be, we're just going to measure this number throughout the quarter to give us feedback that could be a key result there's no reason you know um if you're pushing forward though something should be probably changing so is a measure doesn't change well you I'm might just say this get... measure we would we would want this measure to go up right you might say that then it's a result the measure went up <laughs> Oh, okay so you're not mandating that there has to be a number that you're focused on hitting by 
it could just be simply this this measure goes up. Well, a measure suggests or down, right? Depending on that you're measuring something. Yeah. Right? In the word. So yeah, I'm mandating that you pick something that you want to see change that you can't change just by doing it. So if I said my change is three blog posts a week, I could just do that. If I wanted to write three blog posts a week that generated uh, X number of visits to my site or got talked about on Twitter, that starts to get at the, am I having an effect question? Um, So you could call it a result, you could call it a measure, but the important thing is, did something change in the world because of what I am doing? Or am I just doing stuff? La, da, 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 you know, <laughs> you don't you don't want that. And a lot of companies do that. It's the infamous uh, outcomes over input output. You could output all day long, but if nothing's changing, then why why are you bothering? You might as well lay in bed and watch Netflix for God's sake. So, so really, you're trying to get at is is something changing out there? Is something changing out yeah. there? Exactly. And, am well, I making a difference? Yeah. Could be the question. Am I making a difference? Is all this work? I'm doing, making anything better. I feel like, is there a more profound question that we can have in our life? Does what I do even matter? Yeah. And I think the only way to find that out is by figuring out what should I, what does it having an effect even mean? And how will I know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I see that. The other part of what you're saying here is this idea of the 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 objective and that being heartfelt language. And I found that when I've worked with teams that this um, this can be something that takes a lot of work because because certainly when you're working in large organizations, there's there's a kind of a acceptable mode of speech, right? There's this dry, dreadful kind of corpse speak that all of the objectives are written in. And 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 I don't know what, but somehow they get ground through this machine and they come out sounding like nothing. And actually having people to step out of that mode of communication and saying, come on, what's going to get out of bed in the morning? What's yeah. talking about delight and love and these and these this, this type of language can be can be quite challenging, I found, for teams. What's, it, what's your experience there? Well, you used exactly the phrase I use in my workshop, which is when the alarm goes off in the morning, if you use alarms, do you leap out of bed going? I'm going to change the world today. Or do you just go, oh, heavens, and hit snooze? And um, a lot of that comes out of that objective. So um, wordsmithing can matter. So I, I, I said earlier that I think of an objective as a mission for three months. If you think about a mission statement, it is inspirational. It is meaningful. It is something that says, I'm going to work because. I really do want to make something happen other than a paycheck. And I suppose, I know that, in fact, I know from Adam Grant's work that there are a bunch of people who want to keep their life in this corner and keep their work in that corner. And I respect that. Um, I'm not that kind of person. Most people in the uh, the Silicon Valley um, are life and work mushed together people. <laughs> I know that's a that's a quirk of our culture, but I still think even if you're just going there eight hours a day, isn't it nicer to feel that it's something meaningful? Um, I think I've lost the thread of your question. <laughs> I suppose it, what we're trying to bring out is what's distinctive about the way that we write objectives and create the objective, and, and certainly taking it largely your direction in terms of how we create these, I've found that it is, it, it, it is quite a big shift for people. Oh, yes. Language, language. So for me, um, I'm a writer as well as a teacher. And so I like to visualize who it's for. So I often think of somebody who I really want to get excited by this. So maybe I'll picture some QA person who, you know, She is working this job and when she gets home, she's studying to be something extraordinary like a game designer. So the job is just money, but then how could she feel truly excited about the work she's doing in a way that makes her want to throw down a little more and really make sure no bugs get through? And so 
I think, what language is going to tell her why this product is so important? What language is going to make her really, really believe that it's worth her spending her time to get this right? And so I might think about things like delighting a customer because delighting people is is a, a beautiful way to spend your time. It's wonderful. Or perhaps it's about changing an unfair industry. You know, um, I think too often leaders shy away from inspiring. And inspiration is a critical, critical part of what any leader has to do. And it can be a little hard, but I think CEOs, new managers, even product managers have to realize that they don't have to have all the answers. They can partner with people. So it can be useful for a CEO to partner with a marketing person if inspiration isn't in their core skill set. Um, and, and I, you know, I used to think marketing people were horrible and then I worked with a good one and that changed my life forever. Um, a truly great marketing person looks deep at a product or an objective and says, why does this matter? And what language is going to communicate that the greatest marketing people are great communicators. And so, you know, whether you do it yourself or whether you partner with somebody, it is worth getting language that's going to touch the hearts of your employees and inspire them and give them meaning to the work they're doing and help them understand that they're part of something bigger than themselves. So I, I know I have, I think I have the most ridiculously touchy feely approach to OKRs of anybody on the planet, <laughs> but uh, I, I really believe this is true. I really think it's absolutely critical. If you're going to have a great company, great company comes from passionate, caring, learning employees. And OKRs are a great way to build learning, build inspiration, build passion if they're done thoughtfully. And I know everybody hates to talk about semantics, but language matters. Maybe there should be a, a, a poet in service to the CEO who helps them pick exactly the most beautiful words. I don't know. <laughs> Oh, wait, in residence. Well, that's interesting. Poet in residence. My last, my last guest was a musical conductor who takes um, people into his orchestra to, to, to learn how to lead. And we were talking about the idea of a chief musical officer, right? Maybe, maybe, I love maybe it. a chief poetic officer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then the final thing that, uh, that's interesting about OKRs as well, of course, is this idea of how often we might, well, let's just say we've got a, a, a specific uh, number how often we might hit that number. So, yeah, what could you say about that in terms of expectations of hitting them? Um, I'm not completely sure I understand your question. Sorry, so, so the, you... this idea that we've got a 50-50, yeah, I mean, I think you talk about as a rule of thumb, there's a 50-50 probability that we might, we might hit a particular objective. Sorry? 50-50 yeah. chance we might achieve our uh, yeah. uh, result completely or, yes, or or our OKR set, depending on how you're doing it. Yeah, they do have to be stretch goals. Yeah, the sun's moving. Um, I apologize. I'm going to get brighter and brighter as we go along. Nice. Um, but I think what a lot of people, I know a lot of people ask about is the quarterly cadence. Cadence is absolutely critical. One of the best things I learned from Agile is that rituals and cadences are massive for people. It creates habits. Uh, it creates positive behavior. It creates a framework that we can kind of relax into, you know. So if you know that you're always committing on Monday and you know you're always celebrating on Friday, that's a good thing. Um, the thing we don't think about in school, we come to the end of the semester or the quarter and we get graded and we say, oh, I learned that. Okay, what am I going to do next? We don't get that enough in business. And um, the way we learn is by having periods of retrospection. So by ending it every three months, we can say, what did we learn? What did we accomplish when we didn't accomplish things? Why did we not accomplish them? What are the mysteries in the system that suddenly showed up that we weren't expecting when we were planning it? Um, those stopping completely and saying, let's look everything over and then choose what we're going to do next are absolutely important. So that's one of the most critical parts of timing. And then I get clients who are saying, well, we only launch every six months or every year, medical companies. There's a lot of reasons not to do that. 
And that's when I lean into my lean background, uh, pun not intended, I swear, um, because lean is all about reducing risk and making things smaller so you can measure them. So if you have a monthly OKR, what I've come to call milestone OKRs, if you say, okay, we've got a nine month project, what do we, where do we want to be at the end of three months? And what sort of feedback do we want? Do we really want to be hiding out in our own company, not knowing if we're making a difference or not? Um, until we find out at the end of nine months, that sounds horrifying to me. That terrorize, terrifies me. So a th- end of three month milestone might be have a viable uh, product market fit for our new product. And then it, the question is, how would we know? Well, it could be anything from X numbers of alpha customers who are signed up, uh, positive usability and desirability testing. It could be uh, even executive approval. Believe me, that's a stretch goal half the time. So you start asking yourselves, um, how can I break this giant project into chunks that I can take that moment to pause and see if I really am doing the right thing? Am I going in the right direction? Should we even continue with this? Right. So the the cadence is important and the the stretch is important um, because, yeah, why not have them set them where you're expecting to hit them 80 or 90% of the time? Because I think we don't really know what we're capable of. And I think too often we edit ourselves. Too often we don't ask ourselves what's possible. I mean, I have, you know, not to use myself as an example, but I'm going to. Um, I'm, I'm a ridiculous person. Like I said, I just told you I went to art school. I painted uh, there is no reason I should be in the Gates building. I don't have a PhD. <laughs> um, but I have always tried for ridiculous things. I've written books when people say, no, that's for somebody else. And I was like, why can't it be for me? I'll just see what I can do. I'll go for a try. I wanted to make a book that made a difference. And when I wrote Radical Focus, I wrote a tiny 75 page short version of it that I printed at a local printer. I only printed a hundred copies. And I uh, sold them to find out if there was enough interest. And that taught me a lot about what people cared about. And then the feedback I got from that little prototype also taught me a lot about what the book should be. The answer was, it should be very short. (laughs) That was the number one piece of feedback. People love short books. Unfortunately, my new book is much longer, but oh well. (laughs) Some things have to be explained in longer ways. But I just think it's... So critical be learning and getting better all the time. Right. Yeah. And to 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 throw it out there, right? To 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 yeah. To cast. If you try for ridiculous things and you don't make them, well, now you know something. Maybe you know how to do the ridiculous thing when you try again. That's kind of awesome. Maybe you uh, learn that the ridiculous thing is impossible, but there's something else that's really interesting around the corner. And that's why it's absolutely critical to not base compensation on whether or not you make your key results. Because once you do that, people have to sandbag. People have kids to feed, for gosh sakes. People have rent to pay. You cannot say, hey, everybody, try to do this impossible thing. And if you don't do it, I won't pay you. That's in, your smartest people are going to be like, I'm out of here. I'm gone. Um, and what do you but mean if you by say sandbagging for those in unfamiliar, oh, sandbagging is um, <laughs> I don't know why the term sandbagging is used, but it means simply that you choose a goal you know you can make as opposed to trying for something that you're not sure you can make. All of a sudden, your safety is threatened when you connect compensation to the OKRs. And the moment you tie compensation to goals, I can imagine your happiness expert, first of all, would say a few words about that. Um, well, and exactly, the other thing, in, fact, in fact, yeah, the, yes, indeed. The, there's no, uh, no bonuses, right? Uh, well, a lot yeah. of the people who, who I think deeply on the happiness in the workplace reject the idea of bonuses and performance bonuses. Yeah, bonuses, what you want is to pay people enough money so they feel happy and comfortable and can focus. Um, and a lot of the problems with this comes from most managers' fear of firing people which is something I cover very much in the new book is we have, and there's a couple of medium essays if you want to uh, post them in your show notes that I've written about the importance of firing people. Um, You have to get comfortable at giving difficult feedback and you have to be able to fire people. So if you pay people a good living wage that takes the fear out of it, if you remove people who are toxic, if you give feedback to people who 
want to do well, but just don't have the tools and give them that support so they can become the kind of people that they want to be and the business needs them to be in that environment of psychological safety. Then you can say, hey, folks, let's try to do something ridiculous and see if we can. And people should be like, yeah, that sounds amazing. Right. But if you don't have that psychological safety and you're just setting OKRs that are what we think we can make. And if you don't make them, no raise for you, that's going to be a grim, grim workplace and not a place that I personally would choose to work. Right. So all of these things work in harmony, right, to, to create they the really environment where, where, where we can uh, go beyond, our, I suppose, expectations of, uh, of what may be possible before we enter this process, right? Exactly. What if... What if I could write a book? What if I could run a a half marathon? What if it's easier for people to try to do a half marathon, even though it's unpleasant, because if you can't, well, you can't. So what? At least you got a little healthy, you got outdoors, (laughs) you know, you got to buy some new shorts, maybe. Um, That's the kind of environment you want to be able to do OKRs in, where you're like, okay, we really want to move into this new market. We think it's going to be really important. We'd love to do it successfully. Let's talk about what we our dream is, what we'd like it to look like, and let's aim for that dream instead of aiming much lower. If you aim to be half-assed, I'm pretty sure you can succeed at it. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. right. But they, but then there's of course there's a problem with that is people, you know, they tire of being in a situation where they're not inspired. Oh yes, it's very sad. I mean, I see people who are in their job and they're like, yeah, I go, I do my thing, I go home, whatever you know, it pays the bills. And that always, when I hear that phrase, it pays the bills, it kind of breaks my heart a little bit. Because I I like to think of a world in which everybody's work is meaningful, even if it's meaningful in a tiny way, even if it's just, like I said, getting rid of bugs in a product that will make a difference in somebody's life. That's, that's meaning. It doesn't always have to be the big thing. Sometimes it can be the little thing, but you're part of something big and that can feel good. But yes, um, I know exactly what you mean about those draconian institutions where you're not sure you're going to be able to make your mortgage payment unless you hit your sales quotas. And that's just, I don't know, for some people that's fun, but most people not so much. Right. Exactly. Um, so in your new book, you talk about, um, maybe let's pick up on that point of, of feedback. Um, and are you happy with me sharing from your new book? Cause you, cause I'm very lucky you sent yeah. me an advanced copy from it. Um, You've got a canvas in here, right? You comfortable with me sharing that? Sure. Let's have a look which canvas it is. <laughs> it's the feedback canvas. Uh, and you oh, describe yeah. in, in your book um, this, this mode of giving feed. Um, let me just get the right one up. So this mode of giving, giving feedback, um, which, which I found... Re- very interesting. So just to, yeah, just talk us through this. I mean, for those who are listening, we've got a canvas up here on the screen um, that, that enables people to provide feedback to others. So yeah, talk us through the process here. So this is probably the single most radical thing in the book. So good for you. You picked it right up. <laughs> um, when, I, when I do workshops, I say, if you want to become a mindful team, if you want to become a team where people are genuinely taking care of each other, then you create formal time for them to give each other feedback. So this is a canvas for team members to give feedback to other team members. And there's a lot of advantages to this. Um, it, hearing feedback from a, a peer um, often will influence you more powerfully than a boss, believe it or not, because with a boss, you figure you can hide, but you can never hide from your teammates. There's all, we're also social creatures. We um, care a lot about what other people, uh, other people think of us. So this is a canvas that was designed to get teams in a place where they're comfortable starting to give feedback to each other. So um, what you do is you do it uh, two minutes. You, so let's say this is my feedback for you, yeah. um, Richard, and I put your name there and I'd say your team. And I'd spend two minutes trying to think about what's everything I know about you? You know, are you a dad? Are you a bicyclist? Are you a wine fanatic? What are the things I know about? And this is um, basically trying to build empathy, right? Um, I'm thinking about what do I know about you as a person? And then I think about what are the sorts of things you say? 
And what are the sorts of things you do? And perhaps you say, let's play devil's advocate a lot. And, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and maybe what you do is you always follow up in a really positive way. Um, and you always check in to see if uh, your uh, inquiry was causing any emotional damage. And I might, I might notice these things that you say and do. And then I might think about what are your pains and what does this job mean for you? So maybe one of your things you really struggle about is you're trying to connect with people who are in a variety of technological spaces. Some people have bad mics, some people have uh, too much sun, and it's very frustrating for you to think about some little stupid technical thing might interfere with people's enjoyment of knowledge. And you have so much to gain because you're trying to make more humane workplaces, right? So these are some of the things you want to gain. And so after I've thought about who you are, how you behave, what's at stake for you, at that point, I can start giving you feedback. So I might say, keep this amazing focus you have on the human effects of uh, the workplace. And for change, I might say, uh, maybe you want to have a checklist you send to your speakers ahead of time that says, we're going to be video, uh, make sure your bandwidth is this high, make sure your curtains are here, whatever. <laughs> I'm just making stuff up. But at the point I've really thought about who you are, what you're trying to do, and what your goals are, that's an emotional place where I can actually, with my heart, tell you what I really admire about you and the ways your behavior is getting in the way of your success. And feedback's been one of the single, single hardest things for me to work with. I feel very grateful that I'm here at Stanford because I have friends in the GSB in the Graduate School of Business who work for the infamous touchy-feely class. That's what the students call it. It's actually interpersonal dynamics. And they spend a lot of time working with feedback. So I've been able to build on their knowledge, um, which is really about first you have to know somebody as a person, and then you're in an emotionally appropriate way place to start giving them feedback on the ways their behavior is not serving their goals. And for me, anyway, that was the magic phrase. Your behavior is not serving your goals, which means I have to know what your goals are. I have to understand you. And then instead of being someone who's critiquing you, I'm someone who's coaching you. I'm someone who's, through my observation, giving you information that will let you become more successful. And that's a place where I want to be with my feedback. And that's a place where when I work with my clients, when I work with my students, when I work with the workshops, building that emotional base makes feedback much better for listening. I know a lot of people have advice like, excuse again, I've cussed already a couple of times, so one more won't, probably won't hurt. The shit sandwich is mm -hmm. what it's called, right? Which is one compliment, one criticism, another compliment. Well, if you Google that, you will find there it doesn't work. That um, that's a terrible way of giving feedback. Um, people know that you're just fluffing them up to give them hard feedback. Uh, the two positives aren't enough to outweigh the one negative. What I've found, and like I said, this is based on a lot of uh, the research that I've been exchanging with uh, my colleagues, is that it's much more effective to give feedback with the other person's interests in your mind. You want to give them feedback from a place of your wanting them to be successful. Right. And that's what I love about this current canvas is you, you're forced, if you go through that sequence, to think about that, right? You're not just saying, oh, could you stop doing this? It pisses me off, right? It's like, yeah. my understanding is that this is what you want from life. And this is a, this is a suggestion for change. And that's a big important thing to say, too. This is a quarterly thing. It's not every day. Like every day, if somebody does do something that pisses you off, you should be like, you know that thing, I don't think it's, it's doing what you'd like it to. <laughs> you probably should say that right away. But you know, there's some things that are so deep, you're saving them up because you're like, oh, I got to say this to this person, but I don't know how. I don't know how to find the right words. I don't know how to, how to tell them that their constant interruptions and meetings is making me crazy. And then you go through this canvas and you're then ready to say, when you interrupt me, I feel like my words don't matter. And it makes it harder for me to be willing to share what I know. Um, and that's the Matt Abrams, you know, four eyes, which is, this is the information about what you're doing. And this is how it's affecting me. And here's the consequences of it, how it's affecting me. Right. 
And, and but what I found extraordinary, and I think you're right, it's radical, is that the idea is with this this canvas is you get a team together, each person gets a canvas on the wall, and and the rest of the team got to pile in, right, and fill up that yeah. canvas, post it. And as I as I read that section of the book, I'm like, man, I'm not sure I'd be like super excited about going into that workshop but on the other side of it i could see wow there could be some power there you are changed forever by that workshop and that's why i always tell people implement everything else first before you do this <laughs> do this last because to, once you've built that psychologically safe environment once you've created these shared norms once Which you what else you talk these, about in the book right very important uh, Norms have become the norms for the team. Absolutely. Um, and that would be a, another great thing to unpack, but I suspect we might be running low on time, but maybe we have a couple minutes for it. Yeah, we could talk about uh, it. So, so the thing about norms, which is the thing I would recommend doing way before diving into this canvas, like I said, this is, this is the boss battle. <laughs> if you were a gamer, you know, the, the canvas is definitely the top highest level of, trust and intimacy and growth for a team. And if you can get to that place, you'll never be the same. There's no question about that. The teams I've worked with who have done this, they are profoundly changed. The teams are changed and the individuals are changed. And the individuals are so much better at being their best selves at the end of this. Um, it's very touching because they feel seen. It's, it's a beautiful thing. But before that, let's talk about the baby step. The baby step is much smaller and much easier. So if you think about quarters, you have a quarterly cadence. Um, the end and beginning of a quarter is a temporal landmark, which means um, in our lives, in our calendars, we have these temporal landmarks like a birthday or New Year's Eve. The reason people make New Year's resolutions is because it's a good temporal landmark. So what, uh, with the quarterly cadence, you're now creating four of them, which is awesome. You have now have four temporal landmarks which means you have four chances for a do-over. So let's take an unhealthy team that's been piddling along. People are kind of crabby. They're fighting. They're not really getting stuff done. And you close out Q2. You grade your OKRs, let's say, and you say, hey, we're going to try something new. Let's talk about norms for our team. So let's think of the best team that you've ever been on, not this one. What made it so awesome? What made it wonderful? What was the worst team? What made it so horrible? Well, again, not this team. Okay, now let's talk through what do we want our team to be? And somebody might say, well, you know, it's why do we have to raise our hands? We've been fine just talking. And somebody else could say, well, maybe we're not fine just talking. Um, what I've found is that if you think you're walking into an unhealthy team and you're a team leader, you're a product manager maybe or the manager manager, um, you may want to do this free listing on post-it notes because the problem with talking out loud, it takes a lot of psychological safety to talk out loud. It favors people with a lot of power in the situation, upper management, white men, um, people with a lot of social power. It favors um, people are just comfortable thinking on their feet. But if you can move all these things, like have people write down on post-it notes what was awesome about their team and then have them cluster it. Have them write down on post-it notes what was horrible about a team, have them cluster it, and have them write down the rules, have them then talk through those rules. You can get to a team charter and this is how we want to be together. The other thing that I've begun doing, which has made the norming process even more effective, is including the elements of uh, Aaron Meyer's culture map. So once we've done this sort of bottom-up emergent discussion of what have we seen? How do we want to be? How do we not want to be? Then we'll go through and look at these eight factors um, of culture, which is how do things get decided? Are we going to be consensus driven or are we going to have a final decider? Uh, what does being on time mean? I know it's a funny one, but I actually was working with uh, some clients and they spent 20 minutes talking about what on time to a meeting was. And it was really hard because some people think it's when it starts. Other people are like, wait, I'm coming all the way across the other side of this giant office campus. I need time. Uh, weirdly enough, just discussing time ended up being really powerful because it made people more aware of everybody's situation. Um, and as I said, if you look up Aaron Myers' uh, culture map, and uh, it's got to be Aaron Myers. There's another culture map out there. It's not that one. Um, you'll see all these ways that we bring our assumptions to the table. 
Some people think that if you uh, have feedback for somebody, you should just say it right away. Like, yeah, that pisses me off, like you said. Other people are like, no, 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 you go off privately and you talk to them gently and you say, you know, I really enjoy working with you, but there is this one thing that's kind of bugging me. That's indirect versus direct negative feedback. And it, you might assume that you always have to do the second one, but it turns out some people much prefer the first one. So we just want to take all those assumptions and get them out in the public so that we stop making assumptions and work from real information instead. Right. And the other thing you talk about in the book is this idea that norms are, um, have a context, right, within you know, family, religion, country even. Um, Gosh, yeah. And that's, uh, and that's, you know, that's also important, important to recognize. My big realization when I was reading The Culture Map, she talks just about countries, but the reality is that uh, I grew up in Iowa, and Iowans are very British. That's beautiful. And um, in that they, they say nice things. So you're, if you don't have something nice to say, you don't say anything at all. You're super polite. But even within that, your family, you might belong to uh, a family that just yells and screams at the table, or you might belong to a family that's very quiet and pleasant. Uh, departments. Um, I often like to talk about Zynga in that uh, I was in a team where every Friday we had what we call wine down. There'd be wine and cheese and crackers and we would do our bragging session. One Friday I went down to the business uh, development team on a Friday and they were standing in a circle and each one of them was holding a shot of Patron. And if you had anything to brag about, you could take your shot. But if you had nothing to brag about, somebody else could take your shot. (laughs) Right. So there's a culture right there, right? <laughs> it's totally different. Um, and they did celebrations. Even within departments, they had different cultures. So thinking about how um, there may be tension, there's constant tension. That's the reason I use the sharing layers model, is that here I am, a girl from Iowa, who was taught, don't say anything nice. My, if, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all. And on top of it, I learned at Zynga to be in people's faces if I have to. My natural personality is actually fairly blunt and straightforward. Now I'm at Stanford, which is the most PC place I've ever worked in my entire life. Everybody is so lovely and so careful, careful. And I'm like, oof, that should I be cussing quite so often? I worked in tech for a long time. Um, And so you have these tensions of all these cultural norms and you have to figure out how to navigate it. And it can be painful to learn that on your own. But if you can just go ahead and say, this is how I like it. This is how you like it. Um, If we disagree, let's come up with a compromise. You know, let's find a way to talk to each other and that's more effective. Right. And you'll bring that that type of model into a workshop when you're talking about norms to to broaden that conversation. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing it with my students. So the funny thing about students is um, we only have quarters, which means if you're in a bad team, you just have to wait and they'll go away. And I always tell my students, you know what? In the real life, bad team members never go away. You actually have to fix it. And they're like, ah! So going through this norming exercise, we do it for both the class. And we say, what kind of class do we want to be? Do we want to be collaborative? Do we want to take care of each other? What does criticism look like? How do we want to critique each other's works? And then the students get into teams and they do the same thing and they build team charters. And um, whether it's students or whether it's clients, it changes the conversation so profoundly. And it, a lot of people change from assholes into somebody who just has a different cultural upbringing. And that change creates empathy. And from empathy comes conversation. And out of conversation comes cooperation. And out of cooperation comes, hopefully, excellence. Right. And, and I think the other point you make in the book is that this, a lot of people are familiar with the storming, norming, performing. Of, and this is one way to accelerate that, that norming phase by having a, Absolutely. a big, bringing consciousness to that, right? And having explicit conversation there. And then by checking in on your norms at the end of the quarter, you can re-enter storming to make your norming even better. You can say, hey, we said we're going to be this kind of team, but this is how we're actually acting. What are we going to do about that? And I know that people are like, oh my God, I already went through all that. Do I have to do it again? 
And the answer is only if you want to become incredible, only if you want to get to excellence. Sometimes you have to do the hard things to have the good things. Yeah, and just a, a point on the language there, which I hadn't come across before, I had to look it up, but this idea between low context and high context cultures, could you say something about that? Oh, I wish. I wish I could remember the, uh, the anthropologist who coined that term. Edward, maybe Devon? No, I, I can't remember his name. I'm going to misquote him. But um, he's the one who first coined it. It's used uh, extensively in anthropology. And high context cultures are cultures in which the culture tends to be homogenous. And so you can say something very subtly and everybody shares the same context as you, so they'll actually understand it. So Japan is a very common um, example. It's a, a fairly small island. They were isolationist for a while. Their uh, culture has been fairly homogenous for a while. And so you can say, are you coming Sunday to this meeting? And the person can say, well, it's my daughter's birthday. And you don't have to say anything else. You know he's not coming. He's going to be at the birthday. Birthdays matter. You don't skip your daughter's birthday. Or maybe it's uh, simply you know, something even more subtle than that. Um, have trouble making up an example. Low context cultures are cultures that are highly heterogeneous. So you see it in America. Uh, Holland is that way, um, I believe, because of all the trading they did and because they get, you know, there were a lot, it's a small country surrounded by different cultures. Um, and in low context culture, you can't be sure if people understand what you're talking about. And therefore, you tend to be a lot more blunt, a lot more straightforward, a lot more clear. Um, and I'm, I've, I guess maybe I'm so blunt because I've traveled so much. I've learned that if I don't say exactly what I mean, I'm not going to get the results that I'm hoping for. So um, knowing whether it's a high context or low context culture that you're entering um, is really critical because if you are entering a high context culture that isn't like your own, you're going to have to not assume anything ever. And you're going to want to do things like get things in writing, make sure things are highly, highly clear. Uh, what are our next steps? Have we all agreed to it? What time are we going to do it? If you're um, in your own high context culture, then perhaps you can just, I, I'm so rarely in these, so it's, but I can just say, hey, you know, so that, 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 that meeting, yeah, I'll take care of it and you're done. You know, it's because it, you all know what meeting, we all know who, what taking care of it means. You don't have to fiddle in the details. Right. Where you've, where you've developed a lot of homogeny. Yeah. 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 And that, um, that is one of the more difficult of the eight cultural items to get your head around. Um, I like her shortcut. You should definitely have her on the show sometime. Um, I just I adore her work so much. Um, but Going low context is always your safest bet. <laughs> Just pretend nobody knows what you're talking about and be as clear as humanly possible all the time. And that is, that's sort of the, uh, the shortcut. Right. In fact, and that's maybe, so going low context with my guests for the podcast, give them a checklist. That canvas is, is already giving me value. It's, it's, that's great. Oh, no. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> But, but that's just a really constructive example, right? In, in 60 seconds, you gave me an awful lot of value and you said things to me you probably wouldn't have said had you not gone through that packed canvas. So it demonstrated it. No, perfectly. I had to prove to you first that I had spent a little time trying to think about you and your situation and what you were hoping for. I, had, I, I mm. think that's the other thing. It made it easier for you to take the feedback because I pro had proven to you that I thought about you. I thought about what you wanted. I thought about what you valued. And I was able to speak to you from a place of understanding, even if it was a tiny bit of understanding. <laughs> right, and, about, but, and I know we're sort of skipping back to that now, but what I also love about that is the potential efficiency of it, right? I mean, those kind of conversations can happen, right? But with a manager and a subordinate, you know, maybe once a year or once a quarter if you're lucky in it. Like, but the fact that you can get, I don't know, a team of 10 in a room and all of that to happen all at once in one session, it just, I mean, that does sound like a 10x level of uh, productivity gain in terms of feedback, yeah. Yeah, well, you're welcome to go for it. Like I said, it's a it's a small number of people who feel comfortable doing it, but the people who do it, they're so happy they did it. That's mm. what I can say. Yeah, but I wouldn't yeah. do it without psychological safety. Right, and the and and the norming that we've just explored as a way to 
build that before you get into something that's, I guess, pretty high octane, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good. Okay. Um, well, we've been going for an hour. This has been, this has been great. I've learned, I've learned so much already. Um, so so the, the question we like to ask a lot of people on the show, Christina, is the title of the show is being human. Um, what, what for you, what does it mean to be human? Uh, <laughs> everything I said. I mean, I think as much as I have a mission to my life, it's how do we make work more humane? We're... Gosh, there was a wonderful conference called Being Human that disappeared, and it was uh, magical because it explored that question. There's so many things, like if I put magnets in my fingers so I can sense magnetic flow with my hands, am I still human? If I write algorithms uh, that then teach the algorithms to make new algorithms, what does that affect me as a human being? How do I make sense of machine learning? Um, does that make me less human? Does that make me more human? Does that free me up to do more human activities? I think being human always changes all the time, but the core is that we are people with each other. I think that's the one thing that never changes. And that to be around other people, we have got to be compassionate. We cannot share our suffering. Um, there was a study a long time ago that showed that if you shocked a rat and then it turned around and bit another rat, its stress levels would go down. But if it shocked a rat and it didn't have anybody to bite, its stress levels stayed high. And I like to think we're better than rats. That's my hope. I like to think that over time, we will learn how to be, even when we're stressed, kind to each other. Even when we're trying to do impossible things, we take care of each other. That being human means being part of humanity, I guess, is mm -hmm. how I think of it. And when you have that much effect over other people's lives, that's a huge responsibility. And I think for me, that responsibility means constantly asking, well, the question of the Bodhisattva path, which is how do I end the suffering of all living beings? And I think we should all be walking that path and we should all ask every day, how do I lessen the suffering of all the beings that I'm going to come in touch with today. That's the kind of human being, that's the kind of being human I would like to be. And I would hope to help as many other people who want to make those choices, help them make those choices. And I tripped over OKRs. I couldn't have found a weirder thing to work with, but I think of it as a pointy bit of the wedge to help us go, we can be great and we can be lovely both at the same time. Right. I love it. Okay. So for those uh, who'd like to check out more, there's the first book, Radical Focus. Am I allowed to show the, the, yes. uh, the cover of the new book? Well, it is a draft cover, but yes, the title is firm. <laughs> so go ahead. <laughs> is firm. Well, I'll share, I'll share the, the third title of the draft cover, uh, The Team That Managed Itself. And when's that, when's that due to be out? I think September 1st is probably the most likely answer since I'm going to Asia for three weeks with my daughter. So I don't think I'll be, it'll be launching until I get back. But I think September 1st is, it's the covers being done, the proof editing's being done, the back jacket coffee's being written. Yeah, I think I can feel good that I can say I'll be ready for back to school. <laughs> Right. Uh, and is there anywhere, anything else you would um, suggest people ch ch go to if, if they want to learn more? I think Elegant Hack, H-A-C-K. Yeah. Elegant Hack is where I've been blogging since, oh, heavens, 2000 or something. Um, I've been writing there forever and ever. Um, I originally got the URL because somebody once said there are two kind of hacks in this world, skanky hacks and elegant hacks, and only do elegant hacks. 
but now that I'm a writer, I find the, the, the name of the domain even more appropriate. <laughs> I, I hope if I'm a hack writer, at least I'm an elegant hack. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, and that's actually where I first came across OKRs before the book. Now I think about it, actually. Yeah. There you go. Art of the OKR, which is the post on there. I don't know if it's still up there. but Yep. Yeah. Still living on. Great. OK, well, thank you so much. Um, we'll put all those links in the description. Just remains. Thank you once again. Uh, fantastic thank conversation. Um, it's been okay. awesome. awesome. Uh, and enjoy the rest of your day in, in Stanford. Thank you.